Welcome, 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 welcome. <laughs> Propane welcome. fitness in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I always get criticised by Yusuf because I never wear propane apparel when we're recording. It really upsets me. I just feel like everyone knows that we are who we are, and especially in this group. I can't really me? talk because I, I can't get my left and right when I'm looking at this screen. <laughs> well, it is. It's in this, isn't it? Because Johnny's over there. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. Today. Is that because it's the right way around? Yeah. They say. Rather than mirrored. Well, they, they say that when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're seeing, you're not seeing what other people see. Yeah. So when you see photos of yourself, you don't like the photos because it's backwards to what you're used to. See, a photo in the mirror looks the same to me. You've just obviously got a very Is that what that means? symmetrical face. <laughs> anyway, today we are talking about a topic that's quite close to our hearts. Uh, if dieting and training while working an office job. <laughs> this is because Johnny and I both worked in the financial sector for a few years between us and had to manage competing in powerlifting and dieting, training, gaining muscle, losing fat, all of this stuff while working long hours in stressful jobs. And it's a really common problem that we see with our clients as well. So we thought, you know what, let's just give you guys the full Monty. I think it's actually, it was the point at which we started making more progress. So when we, when we were both at university, you had you kind of have this, he <laughs> was just going down the secret trap door. Um, you have, there's a luxury of having a lot of time you can, I was even training twice a day in some instances. Um, and then you go into the real world and suddenly you're really time scarce. But ironically, we, we talk about this in a lot of articles. That's when things really picked up for us. And I think it just, it just comes down to having to manage a schedule a bit better, having to look at what actually matters and what doesn't matter. And then also between us sort of slowly over time, we built out strategies and ways around sort of the common, the common problems. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is, um, Firstly, what we did or what we used to do when we worked in an office job or worked in sort of long, long hours in an office or traveling, working around all the classic obstacles. And then also how we help people who are going through the same thing right now. So let us dive in. So dieting and training while working in an office job. This is the goal. This is who you eventually will become with these tips. <laughs> so um, you may get pulled up by HR because you're not wearing trousers, but it depends on your, your office's dress policy. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can always wear suit trousers, I suppose. You can do. You, then, like a normal person, mm. you'll be all right. So the, the suit shorts, sorry, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems with being somebody who trains and diets <clears throat> while living an office job, especially compared to the, the standard of of activity and dieting of your colleagues is that they are not able to relate to the self-imposed constraints and the kind of pointless discipline. And you'll definitely get a bit of this going on um, from your colleagues who sometimes it's just friendly banter, but sometimes it's people trying to maybe, maybe bring you down a little bit um, because you're doing something that makes them a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps. Something that I actually noticed was that people would even deliberately bait you with things like they would they would deliberately bring in you know food for on a friday like a, a tray full of donuts or whatever and like oh you're not gonna get, have one exactly. oh you're on a diet yeah. oh bless <laughs> and it was deliberately sort of make it worse and so there's that side of it you know there's the constant there's the existing discipline that you have to impose on yourself to prevent you from giving into the diet and then you have external pressure from other people trying to make you deviate there's that side of it. And then there's also the, as you said, for saying like people just don't understand. So when you skip a social event or when you don't want to go out for lunch three days in a row or something like that, they just don't, they have nothing to relate to on that. So it just makes it harder in general. So what are the key challenges that we see when we're working an office job? Now, the first thing is simply time limited training. Now, <clears throat> most people, especially if you're working in a kind of, uh, well, at least for us in finance, the contract says nine to five, 40 hour week, but bullshit, there was not, it wasn't even close. And I didn't even sign that European time directive thing that I did. Well, Johnny did. Johnny gave in. That but... is so you, isn't it? Not signing it. <laughs> <laughs> not signing away my rights. Well, it didn't even make a difference because I still, you, you can't let the team down by being like, oh, well, it's five o'clock. I know you guys have got loads of work to do, but 
see you later. So you will be limited on time, often finishing late, not enough time to go to the gym, or just too knackered to go to the gym, or you start early morning. So really, when you are training, it's going to maybe be morning training, lunchtime, or after work. Those are the three times that you can all weekends. And they're all going to be time limited. So that is a big factor in, um, it's a big challenge with training. So I think the, probably the biggest change that we have people make when they start working with us and they do work in an office environment is to at least consider morning training. And I don't think this is, this isn't covered further. It is, yeah. Oh, it is. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I think, as Yusuf says, the key is you're always dealing with, you know, you're not, you don't have the luxury, especially during the week of, oh, I'll just train for three hours. And that, that luxury disappears as soon as you start working in an office environment. So time limiting, Time limit on everything, to be honest, is a, is a big, big obstacle. Energy <laughs> and motivation to train. We were both looking at each other like, who's going to make that next point? So um, you will often feel like this lady, your batteries get drained. And it's funny because you're sat down all day. It's not as if you're doing a crazy um, physical activity, physical job. Um, but you come away from the end of the day just drained and knackered because you, you've really had a lot of muscular tension and, and head tension <laughs> just from sitting in the office and dealing with rapid fire emails or whatever it is. And this is one of the uh, advantages really of manual labor where you're, you're up on your feet and you're actually more refreshed throughout the day. So this is a big problem, energy and the actual motivation to train. By the time you get home, you know that you've got to then get changed out of your suit put something else on, go back out again to the gym. Like when the last, that's the last thing you want to do. You really just want to sit down and cuddle up with some biscuits and cakes. <laughs> Speaking of biscuits and cakes. <laughs> Was that you? <laughs> that wasn't a dig at you. Oh, though. I see. No, I see how it is. Yeah, I think just to, just to Because he's going up on, to the 105s. I'm going up to the 105s. Just to quickly touch on the motivation point, I think probably the biggest challenge I found with training in general was being able... Because I'm... When you're working, obviously, in a job that doesn't involve producing something physical, there's always deadlines for you know a spreadsheet or a Word document to be submitted by a certain point or whatever. That The pressure's always on you. So to be able to pull yourself away from that and going, no, I'm going to go train now. Now's the time I train. Actually involves more motivation and more discipline to even make that happen at all. So that's one of the downsides of that. Biscuits. We're moving around. <laughs> there we go. Right, yeah, biscuits and cakes. This is one of the, the big problems with the office. At least for me, mm. there was always a tin of biscuits or cakes or something in the middle of the round of desks. And it was always some stupid... It's either someone's birthday or just Friday. Someone's been like, oh, it's Friday, let's get some biscuits. Or it was some kind of e event or occasion that people would just have a very low threshold for. There was something where I worked called Pie Thursdays. Oh god. Which okay. is like doesn't even rhyme or anything. There's not even a reason for that existing. It's just on Thursday people fancy a pie. So you've got to deal with that. And and yeah, as you say, like the, the biscuits in the middle of the in, in the middle of the office or whatever, it's fine to begin with. And if you're not necessarily dieting or you're not at the end toward the end the ends of it, the towards the end of a diet, you might hear that and think, Well, just don't have one. But the temptation starts to become more and more overwhelming as you get leaner, as you've been dieting for longer. And when they're so available and so appealing, it's just like a hazardous environment to be around, to be honest, because people keep offering you them. They're always available. And I suppose that's during the day. But then on top of that, you have the let's go out for lunch. You have Friday night beers, as is the next point. And I think for me, pretty much every week that I was in the office and not working away somewhere, there was the, the option of, of a Friday night beer. So just another obstacle, another hazard. Beer Fridays, pie Thursdays. We <laughs> we had kale and chicken breast Thursdays actually, but did you really? No, no. unfortunately. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one problem with this tendency to overeat is number one, you're sleep deprived. That dysregulates your appetite and makes you and reduces your willpower to actually restrain yourself from eating treats. Number two, you're tired, you're stressed, you want to have a biscuit just to. You're miserable, maybe, as well. So it's just, <laughs> you want something to lighten the mood a little bit. Number three, you're sitting all day. So your metabolic rate is lower than it would be if you were walking around. And, and it's very hard to actually make up that activity. There's a lot of data coming out to say that 
even if you live a sedentary lifestyle that you try and offset by training intensely multiple times a week, even every day, that doesn't fully offset the negative effects of sitting on your metabolism and, and on the morphology of your fat cells. So actually, um, and we'll cover this later, there are some solutions to this, but sitting for prolonged periods, even if you do what you can outside of those periods to make up for it, isn't enough. Which is heartbreaking because I remember thinking, I rem you, you hear all the stuff about how sitting at a desk and being sedentary is so bad for you. I remember thinking while I was sitting at a desk, like, it's okay because I'm training later. Mm. Like, I'm doing my bit to overcome this. But, yeah, the, the idea that one bout of activity in a 24 hours of, of a sedentary lifestyle doesn't, doesn't cut it is pretty upsetting to hear. So, the next one's a, a late finish. So, we've kind of covered the, you're lacking the motivation, you're lacking in energy, you probably feel pretty overwhelmed, pretty drained. There's increasing temptation from every angle, both during the day and in the evening. And then top, to top it off, you're, you're tight on time because most people, as you have said at the beginning, like you, you have a 5 p.m. sort of suggested finish, but it never actually ends up being a 5 p.m. finish. It's the same as the recommended number of servings on the front of a, a pack of cakes. <laughs> you look at it and it serves 14. No, it doesn't. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> serves me and only me in the next 30 minutes. So, yeah, I think a, a late night finish or, or later finishes just decrease the chances of you having time to prepare a meal that's compliant with your, with the program, with your macronutrient targets of the day. It decreases the chances of you getting a training session in. It just decreases the chances of you being successful because the time that you had fenced off to train, to go to the shop, to pick up the food that you need, to make the dinner that you were going to have, all disappears. And that leads as well to higher stress and just a bad time, I suppose. Awful. So yeah, so we talked about stress, late finishes, all the food that's available. And there's also just again sitting down for that long every day i remember feeling like an old man standing up at five six seven p.m where your hip flexors are tight you just you've been sort of hunched over a computer for all day and not had much awareness of your body and then you're expected to go and perform barbell movements through a full range of motion it's like this is not gonna for, happen for more weight or reps than you've ever done before <laughs> yeah and literally i remember there being a there being points where i was i'd get up from work and think there is no way I'm going to be able to train. Like I'll be able to do something, but there's no way I'll be able to do. Like, I'm supposed to do heavy triples squats yeah, today. Just not going to happen. So there's the weekend panic, and there is also the commute. So the weekend panic tends to be either overeating during the weekend or trying to cram loads of stuff in, and again adding to your stress. Uh, not having yourself ready for Monday by the time it comes around, you get that Sunday evening panic, and also the commute. In fact. No, I'm not going to get it now, but um, <laughs> the, the the commute is often dead time. And if you live in London, for example, that is an extra four hours a day for most people, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, door to door. And often it's not productive time, it's exhausting, and it's just going to add to the, um, or it's going to limit the amount of time that you have available to train as well. And linearly decrease the motivation that you have to train as well. So you, I remember I'd have like a 90 minute drive from where I was working to the gym. So I'd be when I was working in Way, for example, and you get in the car, gym bags in the back, thinking, great, I've got to do heavy triples this evening. And then you get to the gym after a 90-minute drive and just think, oh, there's absolutely no way this is going to happen. Um, the other thing about weekends, I think for most people, and again, this is something that I experienced firsthand, most people get to Friday, they've had a crap week at work, a few beers on Friday night leads to five 15 beers on friday night you wake up on saturday hungover saturday's a write-off wake up on sunday feel behind realize you've got that report to submit on monday morning don't go to the gym on sunday feel behind for monday and oh. then the next week begins <clears throat> with yawning on the train with a pink tie and a blue shirt on that's that's very familiar to me as well just the sense of just stumbling through life yeah and not being able Always to stop. catch up so those are the challenges that we face during an office job hopefully you've seen that so far and you've thought actually yeah they all ring true. Um, if none of them ring true, then you either don't work an office job or you're already implementing everything in this module. Some so, people, I suppose, <clears throat> maybe do have more more command over their time, maybe do finish at a reasonable time each day, maybe don't have the, the constant sense of overwhelm and things like that that some people do in, in longer hours. But 
that's st this stuff we're going to be sharing still can be used to get more out of the, the schedule and stuff that you, that you do already have in place. It's definitely an art that you'd get better at and ultimately have more time in general and be happier and continue to make <clears throat> better progress than if you were stumbling through the week. So the solution to all of these things revolves around having flex in the plan. So you need some kind of contingency. You've got the perfect outcome, the perfect thing that you think you should be doing if you had infinite time, infinite money, if you found the cheat codes and you had unlimited ammo and, and all that stuff. <clears throat> and then you also have the contingency, the fallback option that if something is limited, if something goes wrong, if you have to work late one day, if you have to skip your lunch, how do you then still hit your targets without going crazy? Now, the key practices, these are the core of your dieting and training and should always be the case regardless of what you're doing. This is kind of the, the core, the, the commandments of propane really, mm -hmm. which is train three to four times a week with a large circus dumbbell, um, <laughs> weigh in daily every morning, post poo, pre breakfast naked at the same time. So you have a comparable daily weigh in and actually that picture Although it's a uh, an analog scale, you want to be using a digital scale because you'll get a higher level of precision with that. And if you do that as well, if you have that that data point every morning, everything else can almost go badly, or you can completely fall off the program. But as long as you have that consistent reading, there's always a way to sort of take a moment, take stock, and think: right, what's going wrong? What do I need to change? So having the training in place and having the daily weigh-in in place is is kind of the bare minimum. Like if you're doing those things. It's things aren't going to, they're never going to go terribly. You're never going to stray too far off the program and forget that, what's happening. I think that's key, the straying too far off. off uh, if you're doing daily weigh-ins, you're going to spot very quickly when things start to stray. If you're not doing it, you're doing weekly weigh-ins, you may have happened to, you may actually have an average weight increasing, but on that one day that you weigh in, it might be slightly lower for whatever reason. Maybe you've been drinking the night before and your weight is artificially suppressed, and you're not actually going to spot that you're gaining fat for four or five weeks in a row. And then by that point, it's harder to recover that uh, fat gain. The analogy is like checking your bank account, like sometimes before you get paid, sometimes after you get paid, while trying to save money, and you've got no idea really what's going in what's that, in what direction. So making sure that you keep a consistent, it'd be really ritualistic about when I weigh in, the, the time I weigh in, the environment that I weigh in, and trying to keep that as a consistent thing that you do every single day. And I, I went as far as buying a set of portable scales you can get off Amazon. We'll include a link somewhere at some point with this. But you can get them um, if you just search travel scales. And I, I put them in a bag. So if I ever got called to work away somewhere, I knew that no matter what, I still maintained that habit. I still maintained that measure. So training three to four times a week, getting your daily weigh-ins, and then hitting your average weekly calories is another big one. So we talk a lot about keeping things as simple as possible with, with the diet side of things and just aiming for a weekly average or a weekly total as much as possible. And one of the reasons that's so beneficial when your life is not necessarily a predictable 24 hours a day, every single day that repeats, is you need to have uh, the ability to have a higher calorie day or a lower calorie day. You need to be able to adapt as things crop up at last minute. So remove yourself from the, I need to hit these calories every single day and start focusing on what is my weekly average and that way, if you get to Thursday and things are straying too high, you can have a, a stricter Friday or a stricter Sunday or whatever fits in with your schedule. Next thing, one of the key practices, <clears throat> and some people flinch at this idea, is sleeping seven to eight hours per night. <clears throat> so look over the last three weeks, what's been your average sleep time? Do you even know what your average sleep time is? Like sometimes if we're not tracking it, we may think we're sleeping more than we are. Are you going to bed at a consistent time? Are you waking up at a consistent time? Are you finding that you require an alarm clock and that you often banging the snooze button? Are you sleeping in on weekends? All of these may be signs that you're not sleeping enough. Now, the big problem with this, and I'm not just saying this because it's like a general thing that's good to do to sleep more, but this will directly impact your ability to stick to a diet. Insufficient sleep leads to these things. So unfortunately, there's effects on homeostatic feeding behavior and non-homeostatic, so both the psychological and the physiological sides of appetite regulation, as well as the general drive to reduce your physical activity when you're underslept. All of these things combined, along with an office job as well, lead to a horrible cocktail for fat gain, increasing your energy intake and reducing your expenditure. 
So really, you're shooting yourself in the foot big time if you do not sleep enough for you. And it does vary depending on the person, but a, uh, a good sign of whether you're sleeping enough is do you hate life when you wake up <laughs> in the mornings? Um, yeah, so. do, you, do you wake up and feel like you should, should be continuing to sleep? I think, Or do you feel the need to lie in at a weekend is another good sign? I think even if you take the physiological, metabolic side of it away and think, well, if I wake up and go to work feeling knackered, what's going to be the impact of that? For most people, it means that the same amount of work takes longer, which means that you have less, even less time to do the things that you want to do, which will be train, manage your diet, have free time, things like that. So I think something that I was always very aware of was how productive I was on a day where I'd slept eight hours versus six hours. And therefore, the time I was able to finish work, how I felt going into training that evening, my hunger during the day. And I think everybody's had the, the feeling where they have a late night or a, a crap night's sleep and they wake up and their hunger's just kind of all over the place. You start feeling hungry mid-morning when you don't normally feel hungry mid-morning. Meals that would satiate you normally don't do the same thing. So that's a, a massive, massive deal is getting enough sleep. And unfortunately, most people see sleep as optional or as a luxury. So much so that they're like, I'll sacrifice my sleep during the week and I'll, I'll catch up on the weekend. It doesn't quite cut it if you go through the week feeling knackered and only catch up Saturday and Sunday. It's interesting you mentioned the false economy of trying to sleep six hours and then ending up two hours less productive the yeah. next day. Yeah. You're like, well, if I just slept eight hours, I'd be two hours more productive. And, mm. and feel better <clears> while <throat> being productive as well. Yeah, so, exactly. So the final thing is any kind of self-care habits. It doesn't have to be stretching or meditation, but anything that you do that is you time. For us, those three are pretty helpful and they seem to resonate well with our clients as well. But um, whether it's reading, spending time with your family, whatever it is, but actually actively cutting out time for that is really key to keeping your stress levels down and having some degree of autonomy and control over your life. Because when you start to feel that you're losing control over your time and your life, that's when you start to have this downward spiral and that's going to impact your physique the most. I think creating mental space and slowing things down a bit or, or making things feel like they're happening slower allows you the pause when at five o'clock you sort of start to get sucked into more and more work again and you think, actually, you know what? I'll go train. I'll take a few hours off. And if you need to work again, you can return to work a few hours later once you've had a, had a refresh. So the only thing I would probably add to that on top of stretching, meditation and walking would be just scheduling things in your calendar. So making making an appointment with yourself to train, making an appointment with yourself to stretch. Sounds really basic, but if it's in there, most people treat their calendar at work pretty seriously. They take meetings seriously. They turn up to meetings and things like that. So make, treat your training as the same thing. It's the same level of commitment and it requires the same attention from you. So moving on to training. So we, we typically recommend something like, as I used to mention before, three or four times per week. One of the benefits of four times a week that I used to find was the nature of the job that I worked was that I would get pretty last minute. So like the Friday before I'd be told, oh, you're working your way next week. And suddenly you realize I don't have gym access. I can't train in the way that I want to. How do I go about adapting my training? And so four times a week was something that I was able to, to compress and do six days a week if I needed to, or down to two days a week. And it, it was very flexible and something like five, three, one, something that reduces the training down to there's three sets and one working set that I need to do allowed me to make keep things extremely quick and flexible if I needed to. The trainings can be so maximal if you need it to be. And it's so simple. Like you can take it, make it work for you right now. And it doesn't require constant adjustment and constant overthinking. If you want to go a step further than that, you can do an out of the box training program that we've written for you for free. It's called dieting and training for the busy slash lazy man. And you can download that program from our website. So um, I will include, I'll include that link now. Uh, there we go. It's in my history because it's such a um, such a great article. <laughs> but, so there we go. You can uh, you can follow that. It's two to three times a week training. It doesn't require spreadsheeting or templating. If you're away and you don't have a training log with you, then you can just get in the gym and just follow it. So check that out if 531 is, is overkill for you. Watching Yusuf navigate 
a keyboard and a, and a laptop is honestly like watching a chess grandmaster. It's <laughs> nauseating. Um, so something I alluded to earlier or mentioned earlier was morning training. Um, pretty much everybody that I that I coach that works a job that involves this kind of 5 p.m. is up for question scenario prefers morning training. And it's one of the benefits is that so many situations can can require your evening at last minute with no notice. Very, very rarely. I and mean, I'm sure it does happen if you work with international uh, offices and things like that. But very rarely do you have to wake up at 5 a.m. for a meeting. Like it's certainly less rare than a 5 p.m. meeting. And so the morning's a time you can carve out, make consistent, and it's your own time. And if you make that your habit, so three times a week, four times a week, you just know I wake up at this time. By the time I've arrived at work, my training's done. It just removes that feeling that you're constantly sort of out of alignment with the stuff that you want to do. So you can work till 7 p.m. and it doesn't matter if you need to. So that article that I've written, uh, the top five tips to succeed with early morning training, goes into some of the mechanics of how you actually make that work. It's something that does take a bit of time getting used to. If you've ever had to wake up for an early flight, for example, much earlier than normal and you kind of feel fragile and shaky and cold and pissed off with the world, imagine then trying to go and do a top set of squats. Like it's, it needs some bedding in time. So <clears throat> check out that article, use those tips and make sure you kind of give yourself some time. But if late finishes are a problem, morning training is such a simple, quick fix that just makes your training very consistent. Next, we have lunch the big hurdle of lunch and it often <laughs> can look like this if you're out with the uh the team so or worse than that <clears throat> yeah crappy canteen certainly can do so that can be the problem the canteen maybe you're going for a work lunch with the team and you can't be the dickhead that's ordering the lettuce and chicken breast if you're dieting or whatever um you might be getting a hot dog and chips because it's quick convenient and cheap and it's, there's a chippy next door that maybe does a staff discount something like that so <clears throat> the solutions there are many and we want to make things as flexible as possible for you so that you're not coming in and having to eat the same thing every day or having to always eat clean, for example, or any of that. So number one, a protein bar. Portable, keeps for a long time, doesn't have to be in the fridge. You can have a box of them in under your desk. They're just a pretty good way to make sure you're hitting your calories. Otherwise, shakes as well. The only downside of shakes is obviously you must wash out your shaker. <laughs> if, if you've ever had the experience the pleasure of leaving a shaker in your car um, after you've had some whey in it, like in a on a summer's day or overnight, and then it just stinks Toxic. out of your car. That's it. You've got to fumigate. So, something I've been told by a few people, I've not experienced this firsthand, but apparently the metal shakers that companies like My Protein, Bulk Powders, Protein Works are starting to do don't smell as much. Right. So that's a that's a top tip, but don't don't blame me. <laughs> if it's if it's not true, I just a few clients have mentioned that the metal shakers are better for that. If you do have to leave a protein shake in the drawer for whatever reason, um, baking powder quite good as well. But what for putting in the shaker? Yeah, it just helps oh, clear right. out the smell. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you can have so protein bars and shakes are kind of the convenience thing, and then pack lunch as well. Something that I used to do a lot does does come with a bit of criticism. To be honest, uh, most people don't bring a pack lunch. They they just go with whatever the and the canteen's offering, so you'll have to handle a few questions, but it does just mean that you are in a situation where that lunch is taken care of and you don't need to think about it anymore. Um, something that I used to do a bit more than, than planning my meals in advance was actually either skipping the first meal of the day, skipping breakfast and, and bumping that back. So if you know that there's going to be something at the at midday, so like a, a tea meal or a lunch out or something like that, Skipping that for skipping breakfast, it's breakfast something that you normally do, and just freeing up the calories for the, for the latter half of the day, or some of the we call the two one day one the two one day planning method, which is basically just batching sort of the boring stuff in the first portion of your day. So the first two meals would be hitting the, the functional aspects of your diet, the fiber, protein, micronutrition, getting enough water in, things like that. So that in the evening, if you want to just be completely free and eat whatever you want, you can do that. The, you could flip things on its head if, if lunch is the, is the meal that you're going to be um, having the, the fun aspect with. So the first meal and the last meal of the day would just be, I know that in the morning I'm going to hit my pro, most of my protein intake, cover off my fiber, and then I'll do the same in the evening and allow myself to have the burger and chips at lunch, subject to my calorie requirements. So there's, there's no better feeling, to be honest, than being able to do stuff like that with colleagues and friends or whatever, 
and feeling still in control of things, still feeling like you're following the diet program, still feeling like you're adhering to the rules. 100%. This is so important to be able to still enjoy your life and not just live this monastic lifestyle because you're just going to be running against the grain all the time and you're not going to have the support of your co-workers in this. So if you can fit in and just be what we like to describe as the swan on top of the water where there's a really coordinated mechanical movement underneath the water, but from the top, it looks like the swan is just gliding across. And so you want to be that person, the person who's in shape and no one can really figure out why. So if you're able to just go out and... and um, blend in having lunch for example but because the other two meals are fitting your macros and you're able to adjust things on the fly then you'll hit your goals without feeling like you're restricting yourself or being socially weird by not doing what the rest of the team are one of the ways to, one of the things to do every day as a way to sort of ensure that this is always going to work for you is just a, a five minute habit of before i eat my last meal of the day i'm going to if I haven't already, enter everything into whatever tracking app you use, whether it's my fitness pal or whatever, and just make sure that I know before I even prepare my evening meal that I know where I am. And if you just do that one five minute habit, you're always going to be able to either stick to the calories and macros for that day or know that, okay, I've gone over by three, 400 calories today. I need to make that up somewhere else in the week. And it you, you end up playing what we call macro Tetris. So sort of dropping in sometimes some weird meals, but you always end up pretty much in line with where you need to be. I once got a text from Johnny <laughs> with a picture of his macro Tetris meal. It was meal number three um, when he was traveling for work and it was a kilogram of yogurt <laughs> with fruit pastels in it. Now, I thought from the scale of the picture that it was a, a small pot of yogurt with jelly tots in it. But no, I... So, so it was, <laughs> asked him it to was Fahe Total Zero Yogurt and they make a small one, like they make a 250 gram one. And it, so yeah, you thought it was that with jelly tots, but it was the kilo version <laughs> of fruit pastels. But it hit my macros perfectly. The scaled version. And I'd been out for dinner that evening. So, you know, you, you, there's That's a definitely feet, a win. You're sitting in the hotel just feeling like you've completed life because you're having an entire bag of fruit pastels. So yeah, we, as we've discussed, if you have a team meal as well, you can fast up until that point and use the two one-day planning method. We have a, an ebook that covers this and many other strategies in more detail that you can get from our website, ripinfitness.com. So team meals, um, we've discussed fasting until the meal, and the other problem is alcohol. Now, alcohol is just, it's too big a topic to cover in this session. So the best thing to do is if you really struggle with alcohol and how it fits into your diet, Check out, again, the article on this, propinfitness.com forward slash alcohol, and you'll be able to see the full strategies there. That took Johnny a while. Yeah, it's more like a dissertation. It's like 8,000 words, but it, it does cover all of the aspects, really, and there is a lot to consider with alcohol. But I think the key takeaway is that you don't have to live a life where you don't drink. If you're, Even if your goal is aggressive fat loss, it can still be worked in. And I think what's important is that you're aware of the strategies and that you just do a bit of planning in advance. Because if you just find yourself on the ninth pint on a Friday night and there's, <laughs> you, you've got no plan to deal with that, then... It's very easy to just go, fuck it. I'm exactly. Just... Like Saturday's training is probably not going to happen. Sunday's training will be lackluster at best. The diet for the week is, is completely gone to pot. So having a strategy and a plan in advance is, is key, crucial. Right. Next we have tightness. So that was one of the challenges we outlined at the start. And this can often feel like you at the beginning or at the end of a, uh, a work day. Now, step one is you can have a chat with your ergonomics department of your, of your office. A lot of offices in HR are really into this stuff now. It's become quite fashionable. Um, now, standing desk, sometimes they will replace the desk or they can even just take you for an ergonomic assessment and look at the way that you're sitting and see if there's anything that they can do from a desk and office design perspective that will improve things. I think the, there's a lot of people that I know now who are getting standing desks fitted by their, by their office just because they asked. So it's always worth asking the question. I would just say, if you are going to make that transition to do it slowly, we're actually at a standing desk right now. And what I would say is that the transition, if you've been sitting your entire life, which most people have, going straight to just standing all day is a recipe for a lot of aches and pains. So just transitioning to that slowly and piecing it in, kind of having maybe the first hour of the day where you stand and then sitting down and gradually increasing the time that you stand throughout the day. Now, 
there are a couple more strategies and some of which may look you may make you look a bit weird in the office <laughs> however luckily we are going into a, an era where more and more people are living healthier lifestyles in quotes and so having a hockey ball that you put in your ass every day <laughs> at work becomes less and less weird as the years go on which is good because i think yeah, it's in your bum cheek we should clarify yeah, yeah. i mean don't <clears throat> <laughs> unless your office condones it don't put it in your office cup. but anyway i used to have a hockey ball at my desk and i would just sit with it in my piriformis which is the uh, one of the external hip rotators um on the side of the glute and that was that was very helpful to keep the hips loose um often my my left hip would be the thing that would tighten up the most from sitting at a desk and it's you know a pound on ebay or something to get a hockey ball something that you can use if you're in the UK, you can pick up a load of them from strengthshop.co.uk and they're uh, really cheap. And yeah, so I used to, I think hip flexors, um, glutes, hamstrings are the things that bother most people and that can lead to back pain or back problems. So I would put the hockey ball in my hamstring and just just behind my knee and flex and extend my leg past the past the ball. And it, you'd be amazed at how much of a difference it makes when you stand up. Periformis is another one. Just keeping on top of the tightness that's slowly accumulating throughout the day so that you don't get to 7 p.m. or wherever you finish and stand up and think, oh my God, I feel terrible. The band is not, I think I know what you're going to say, it's not something I've done at work. Yeah. But I'll so, take it away. Yeah, so the, the My Protein <clears throat> Resistance Bands are the ones that we use. I think many different supplement and strength companies have them now. Um, just get a relatively light one, uh, light to medium. And there's a few things you can do with it. Rear delt band pull-aparts with your hands facing up. So palms facing up with them are quite good to counteract the forward slouching kyphotic posture that we adopt when we're sat in the office. The other thing you can do, and this is something that we got from Bryce Lewis, um, is to wrap the, it's going to be hard to explain this, but wrap the band around your back and then loop both of the ends around your knees so that when you're sitting up, it pulls you into a lumbar extension. So you're arching your lower back and then you have to turn your abs on to counteract that. And that helps you to turn off your quads and your hip flexors. And it can just be a, a very relieving, uh, if not weird, posture to sit in. <laughs> it's amazing, actually, when you do that, you realize how much your quads are on when yeah. you're sitting. And because you, you sat down in a chair, you think, well, obviously I'm not contracting my, my quads or hip flexors, but you really, really are. And that just allows that to switch off and it just naturally improves your posture. So for more on posture, again, huge topic, and this took me a while as well, mm. but posture 101, so check that out, brokenfitness.com yeah, po forward slash posture. Posture is, is I mean, a whole presentation in itself, isn't it? So it is. That article does a great job of, of breaking it down. So finally, we have stretching routines. Now, this is something that maybe you can't do in the office, but um, you can do it as part of your wind down evening routine. Now, Again, massive, massive topic, but the key areas that get tight with office workers will be hips, hip flexor and piriformis, as we've mentioned, neck and jaw, as well as the scalenes. And these are all lovely stretches that you can try out. And there's the full video there if you want to see. Um, that's a guy called Kit Lachlan, who is really the world authority on stretching right now. He's been on our podcast twice, if you want to check he that has. out. He has. Um, so neck and then also while you're stretching, it's important to hold the stretch for breaths, not time. So what we're used to doing in the old PE classes is sat there holding a, a stopwatch and counting down the seconds and gritting our teeth while we're stretching. Instead, we want to hold the stretch in a position that we can relax into and hold that for 21 breaths. So pec minor is another huge one and you'll probably find that this door stretch is pretty agonizing mm -hmm. and then there's also a traps stretch here as well something that i do and i have a few clients doing it's it's not necessarily the the best it's not like the ideal situation but romwad is a great thing to follow along to if you just want something that's out the box like i can't be bothered to write my own stretching routine or i just want the prescription to do every single day it's i think it's about 10 pounds a month it's an american company they primarily cater to the crossfit world but they just have a 20 to 30 minute per or it even goes down they have a scaled version that's slightly shorter 13 to 30 minutes per day usually i realize 13 is very precise it's the, the one that i did this morning um and it's just a simple follow along as a yoga based routine that again focuses on getting into a position and then breathing into it relaxing into it and it's a it's a nice way to start your day or end your day so it's something that you can add in if you, if you aren't already 
following a stretching program and you just want something to follow along and, and do. Yeah, much more likely to stick to it if it's just a guided session like that. Exactly. Right, so, so far we have covered managing your diet, managing lunch and team meals, managing all, a lot of the downsides of just sitting in a, at a desk and the tightness, and also the training and being able to fit the key stuff in with your training while on a time crunch. Finally, we talked about the weekend panic. Now, this is Monday, <laughs> the Monday routine. Yeah. Now, this is a great um, concept that I got from one of our clients who works in corporate finance. So he works ridiculous hours, um, often 8 until 11 p.m., so 8 a.m. till 11 p.m., a lot of days. And the work provide pizzas if you're working late, terrible ex- situations. Oh, well. awful. Yeah. So, yeah, not a great incentive. Anyway, well, it is a great incentive if you look at it that way. Now, this Monday is the kind of latter, the latter part of Sunday when the anxiety starts to kick in. You realize that you haven't got your affairs in order for the week starting. And if you don't, then you'll be in the position that Johnny described before, where you're kind of stumbling through the week, stumbling into Monday morning, wearing a blue tie and uh, or a pink tie and blue shirt and falling asleep on the train. Or you've forgotten your tie, forgotten your trousers, left your laptop at home, like, oh. just behind to begin with. <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> so the way around this, get conscious, do not stumble into Monday. And the first thing to do is simply a brain dump. This is, as it sounds, sit down 10 minutes with a blank bit of paper or an empty Word document, set a timer for this, and just write, unfiltered, just anything that comes to mind, anything that you have to do that day, anything that's on your mind in terms of uh, emotional holdbacks or any anything like that, just get it out onto paper so that everything that's in your head is no longer just swimming round as open loops in your head and you're able to then action it as it's a bullet-pointed list on a bit of paper. Something that I use all the time is, <clears throat> um, if you look up David Allen, who has written getting things done, which is sort of the seminal book on on to-do list management, I suppose. But he has something which is a, a guided mind sweep, or I think he calls it an incomplete triggers list. And it's literally a PDF that sits on my desktop. And when I do a brain dump, I try and do it a bit more than once a week, but I'll just look down that list <clears throat> and there's trigger words that you look at it, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot about that. It goes on the brain dump and then suddenly you have some a list of things that you're like, okay, what am I going to do with each one of these things? So go down that list once you've written it down and go, what is this? What do I have to do with it? When does it need to be done by? And by the time you get to the bottom, you immediately feel more in control. You immediately feel like you've got a bit more space. And that allows you to just go into the week feeling like you can afford to take time to get your training in and to be a bit more consistent with the habits that you're trying to maintain. So that's kind of the first habit, right and filtered. And then <clears throat> something that we have a lot of our clients do is at the start of the year or the start of the quarter or even at the start of the week is to set goals. So have a, a conscious a conscious direction to your life and the things that you're trying to achieve and then review where you are relative to those goals each week. So taking Sunday's a perfect time to sort of retrospectively review and use that as, as a, a cue to plan forward as well. So what went well this week? What didn't go well this week? How do I need to course correct and adjust to get me back on plan or even accelerate things even further so if you don't have goals then set some you know it's it's absolutely pointless just going through each week mindlessly not really moving things in the right direction so understand that every week needs to be linked in some way to what you're trying to achieve on a, on a higher level one of the easiest ways to do that is to set annual goals or quarterly goals and then just link each week's actions to that and that could be training related work related relationships related. it doesn't really matter what you're setting goals in but having a high level thing to look back on and go, where am I relative to where I want to be? What do I need to do this week to change it? Won't take long as well. It's a two minute process just to look over. Have I hit my weekly target, my weekly checkpoint? And if not, what have been the daily actions that I've maybe not done that have <clears throat> led me to this point? And then how can I in this following week that's to come, how can I change my daily actions so that I do hit that next week's target? Right. Also, Batch processing. I am really keen on the idea of batch processing. <laughs> now, I'm going to start with a story, which is this guy. This is someone that we know who fills up two pounds of petrol every day. And he does this because he thinks that it saves him money. Now, if you're 
if you heard that and you're thinking, well, that's a waste, this is the process, this is the, the underlying principle behind batch processing stuff. Normally, when you fill up petrol, you'll try and fill up a full tank or just however much cash you've got. You want to fill up as much as possible because driving to and from the petrol station costs you in petrol. So it's actually, it's a massive false economy to be like that guy with a silly hat um, to just fill up two pounds a day. Now this applies to everything. There is a transition time in starting and finishing any task. So if you're able to, you can get your errands done in bulk and you minimize that transition time. You just get all of the stuff done in one go. And the biggest example is meal prep. And again, huge topic. So we've got an article on that, got a nice resource on meal prep. But if you can make all your meals for the week, like I did yesterday, I made eight meals in one go. It took me about half an hour, 40 minutes. And now that's just sorted. So the transition time between getting all the stuff out, chopping the onions, frying the stuff, whatever, is just done all in one go. And then all you have to do is turn up and eat. And it minimizes the mental RAM that you have to dedicate the headspace towards making that decision to eat the right thing. Because if the meals are prepped, it's not like you come home, there's nothing ready, so you just raid the cupboard because that's the easiest possible thing. It's, there's even a, a reason to not deviate because you're like, well, I'll be wasting that food if I don't follow the, the meal prep pro process and program. So oh, massively. That, especially for, <laughs> that's one of these such big, big, big hot, hot buttons. Um, that article covers, I think, what are a lot of people's objections to meal prep. So where do I even get started? What, what can I use in a meal prep situation? What can be reheated? What shouldn't be reheated? That meal prep article actually gives you a framework to just make a set of meals for yourself this week. It's so. honestly much easier than it sounds. Like I am completely culinary inept. Like I'm <laughs> terrible with cooking. But if I can do it, I guarantee you can because you can't be any more inept than I am with cooking. So other things to do, laundry or just in general, I think tidying up makes a big difference for a lot of people. Um, the, the psychological change from being in a tidy environment versus being in a cluttered environment does for most people tend to impact their mental state as well. So I think the phrase is tidy room, tidy mind, um, really a, a big thing. So going through any chores, doing your laundry, doing an online grocery shop, saving the cart so that you can repeat that process each week, doing your kind of the, the stuff that isn't necessarily that fun to do, but just doing it once and sorting it for the week so that it doesn't keep having to niggle at your attention throughout the week constantly. And use that time to listen to a podcast, like, for example, the ProPin podcast that gets released every Sunday, or you know, read an, listen to an audiobook, or use that dead time to do something else as well. Fine. So then the final things that you can do on a Monday, once a month, run through your expenses, the monthly bills that you have. And very often, you'll find that um, you might be paying too much for your electricity or for your, um, your gas or uh, your phone bill, whatever, any of that stuff. Again, do it in bulk and just run a price comparison. Money Saving Expert is fantastic for that. It's not very fitness, but just it's just something that can be thrown into this Monday routine once a month. And again, it just takes care of all of this admin stuff rather than having it niggle away at you when you're at work. And these things actually tend to arise from doing the brain dump process. You know, you'll be like, oh, Yusuf mentioned to me that other, that other day that you can get a phone contract for much less than what I'm currently paying comes up on the brain dump, you schedule a time to do it once a month on a Sunday. It's something that you go through. Bedtime routine is another big one. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm a big believer in sort of checklists or routines in general, all the way from morning routine, pre-workout routine, pre-sleep routine. It doesn't really matter. Like anytime you're trying to create a situation, whether that's falling asleep and staying asleep all night, having a great training session, having a great day, it doesn't really matter. Having a series of steps that you go through every night before bed, can just help to create this consistent environment at the end of the day. And you can plan this in advance. Sunday night for most people is a pretty important day or night to get a, to get a good night's sleep. But having something like that in, in your schedule so that at 11 p.m. my bedtime routine starts, I don't have to think about what it is, so that every morning I wake up having had enough sleep, feeling refreshed. And we've laid out a full bedtime routine from T minus four hours all the way to T minus two minutes before you go to sleep. So it's fully laid out in that video that you can check out. Um, there's a lot of surprising stuff in there that um, until I started constructing the module and doing the research for it, I wouldn't have realized would be the case. So definitely worth checking that out as well. All right, so that is it. That is how to manage your diet and your training around an office job. Hopefully that was helpful. Just to recap, we have covered not being 
the one who everyone's pointing at. Ross um, from Friends. Ross from Friends. And the key challenges, how to deal with those challenges, training, nutrition, what are the key things that you need to do every week to keep your progress moving, how to manage lunch and uh, team meals, and how to deal with the tightness as well as the weekend panic. Okay. Something to do if you're listening now thinking, oh, there's so many things that I'm doing wrong or not doing. Make a list of the things that we've covered that are not in there for you and start putting them in place. So just pick one at a time, change things, maybe one thing each week or one thing each day. Slowly move towards a situation where you feel a bit more in control and things are moving in the right direction for training and diet. Speak to you next time. <laughs>